here. I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air with all of the breaking news we've been talking about today. Prosecutors wrapping up their case against Alec Murdoch. They just rested, and now tomorrow it'll be the defense's turn to make its case in the so-called double murder trial of the century, South Carolina, and frankly, people all over the country watching every minute of it. This is the case where Murdoch, a former attorney known by so many, is now accused of killing his wife and son. Charges he denies. You've got the case wrapping up now with 76 witnesses, 400 pieces of evidence, 27 days of testimony, and one extraordinarily rare field trip just today to the hunting grounds of Murdoch, who is now obviously a disbarred attorney. You're seeing here the jury got an up-close look at the dog kennels where the state says Murdoch shot and killed his wife Maggie and son Paul. Look at this. This is where bullet holes still are. More than a year and a half after that day. That is what the jury saw. They also saw Murdoch, as you are seeing him today. Remember, he is pleading not guilty to these crimes. But in more than three hours of closing arguments, the prosecution described somebody who felt the walls closing in, who felt unbearable pressure from the money he stole to feed his drug addiction, basically calling it the equivalent of a Ponzi scheme, saying he wanted to protect his family's legacy. Summing up, what the prosecution sees as the core of the case like this. Listen. Motive, means, and opportunity. <clears throat> Guilty conscience. They say Murdoch had all of it. The motive, the means, the opportunity, and the guilty conscience. They say he also is incredible. They pointed out what Murdoch himself has admitted, that he lied again and again to police, accusing him of rewriting a new story that doesn't make sense, of making up an alibi, basically begging the jury, the prosecution did, do not let this guy fool you. More importantly, exposing the defendant's lies about the most important thing he could have told law enforcement. When was the last time I saw my wife and child alive. Why in the world would an innocent, reasonable father and husband lie about that? The defense will get its opportunity to rebut those questions. First thing tomorrow morning, we'll get the legal breakdown from Danny Savalas in a second. But I want to start on the ground with Ellison Barber, who is live for us in Walterboro, South Carolina. Um, and, you know, Ellison, the language that the prosecution used today, this is their last chance, right, to lay out a narrative to the jury before the jury begins to deliberate. And they said there was a storm descending on Murdoch, that that is why he committed this crime. And they pointed out all the things that they say just defied common sense here. Yeah, right. They focused a lot on that word, the gathering storm. And they even acknowledged to the jury saying, hey, we know this might not sound like a reasonable thing to you. This story might be different than what you would expect. But this man, they say, is different. And I want to remind you of the key parts of what they say is this storm that had been gathering. They say there was one specific case that his law firm had started to ask questions about missing money. They say in that moment, he knew he was being investigated and panicked because he thought, oh, no, everything else I've been stealing for all these years, they're going to find out about that, too. That's one part of this, quote, unquote, gathering storm. The other part, they say, was this civil boat case where Alec Murdoch was named as a defendant. His son had been accused of driving a boat owned by Alec Murdoch in 2019 that crashed and killed a 19-year-old. That was a multi-million dollar lawsuit. They said that was the other part of this storm. And remember, the lawyer in involved in that case told you on the stand that when he found out Alec Murdoch's entire family almost had been killed, I would not have a case anymore because I know there is no way a jury would convict him because he was too sympathetic and there were other people more directly involved, say the vendor who sold uh, Paul Murdoch and others alcohol underage. I would have had to just drop that case against Alec Murdoch. The third part of this storm, they said, was the fact that Alec Murdoch's father, who he trusted so much, who he always looked to for guidance, was sick and was dying. They say all of that came together to create this situation where where Alec Murdoch thought the only way he could buy time to maybe cover up his tracks, do what he'd done all these years, was if he killed his son and wife. Here's more of what he said. The defendant is the one person who was living a lie. The defendant is the person on which a storm was descending. And the 
defendant as a person where his own storm would actually mean consequences for Maggie and Paul. They said that this was someone who thought that he could get out of this quote unquote storm by doing this, that this was someone of prominence. And for him, they say shame was a very big provocation, a big motivating factor, and he couldn't bear with it. Hallie, we talked about that field trip that the jury took, Ellison. Uh, we're going to show some video of it here. Mm -hmm. We didn't, you know, cameras, TV cameras didn't go with the jury on this expedition, but that is the last image, as you see, blurred now, some of the vans pulling out. The last image that the mm -hmm. jury has is of the these hunting grounds where the murder happened. They saw the scenes for themselves. They weren't allowed to ask questions. They were just able to look, basically. And all of it was coming just a couple of hours before the, the prosecution tried to paint this picture of Murdoch as a prosecutor, as somebody who knows what it's like, who knew what it would be like once police get to the scene. They say that he knew what it took to get away with what they say is murder, essentially. I want to play a little bit of that here. Why would he remember that console story? Because he lies convincingly and easily, and he can do it at the drop of the hat. You've heard testimony about that. He's been doing it to all the people who trust him for years. And he did it to y'all. He's manufacturing an alibi. Explain why this is so important for the prosecution here, Ellison, especially given the backdrop that maybe people nationally, you know, aren't as tuned into as folks in South Carolina because the Murdoch name was very well known in this community. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, they're creating this timeline of where they're saying, look, he is a, an important guy. He has always been able to get out of trouble so far. Of course, he was going to try and do it again here. One thing, Hallie, as I was looking through my notes, I want to point out uh, that the prosecution said in his closing arguments, which I think goes on this thread uh, that you're talking about, he was talking about what a good attorney Alec Murdoch was, was saying, hey, look, they have already crafted, and you saw it at the jury scene, these moments, these things where he thought he could create kind of the perfect case to get away with murder. That's sort of the state's perspective here. But they told the, pros, uh, the jury there was one mistake that he didn't expect, one thing that he couldn't outsmart. It's why they say he was trying to find Paul Murdoch's phone. It's why they say he was frantically calling one of Paul Murdoch's friends who had a dog that they were taking care of at the kennel. And they say it was that Snapchat video placing him at the kennel minutes before Paul Murdoch's phone stopped forever. Uh, that is a a key point for the prosecution here and it is uh, Hallie one other thing that they drilled down on that was they said when they were getting to this thing of the liar shame is more important to, to him right. than his family they asked the jury this what father would hold anything back meaning saying that you weren't at the kennel he said what is more important than telling law enforcement in that moment I just saw them a few minutes ago go get them whoever shot them why didn't he do that? And the jury had the chance, too, today to just see the perspective of where things were, where people were, which that is probably hard to measure the importance of that for anyone. Ellison Barber, live for us there outside the courthouse in Walterboro, South Carolina. Ellison, thank you. Let's get the legal breakdown here from Danny Savalo. So, Danny, one of the things that the defense will likely try to say is that Alec Murdoch may not have been, you know, Alec Murdoch may have been a liar, but that doesn't mean he's a murderer here. Um, but there is this question that remains of circumstantial versus direct evidence. And you heard the prosecution try to get ahead of this by saying circumstantial evidence is just as good as direct evidence, meaning there is no, in this instance, smoking gun. There's not an eyewitness. There is not a murder weapon, right, that, there, that is easily accessible here for the jury to see and to be able to link to Murdoch. The prosecution is trying to get ahead of that. And let me show you how. Watch. Sometimes people in common... Discussions will say, oh, the case is just circumstantial, but the law says that doesn't matter. The circumstantial evidence can be just as good as direct evidence. It is just as good. It makes no distinction between that, and the judge will charge you on that. The burden on the prosecution, as you well know, Danny, is to lay out their case beyond a reasonable doubt. So when they say, when, the, when Creighton Walters, uh, Walton says, the, the lead prosecutor here in the close, common sense and human nature will tell you, will, will speak on behalf of the victims here. Are common sense and human nature enough to prove that burden of beyond a reasonable doubt? 
In many ways, you heard some of the classic hits that prosecutors use. Common sense, uh, you point a lot at the defendant, you talk about the victims no longer have a voice, you must be their voice. But, you know, the classics work, and in this case, the prosecutors have a lot to work with. You talk about circumstantial evidence. Frankly, circumstantial evidence is often more powerful than direct evidence. But what the prosecutor was doing there is giving a narrative that is consistent with the jury instructions. We often do this, both the prosecution and defense. We pick the jury instructions that work the best for us and outline them for the jury so that when the judge charges them, they say, oh, yeah, the attorney was talking about that. He must must be an honest guy. So you use the jury instructions, the ones that you really like, to your favor by repeating them to the jury. And that's exactly what was going on here. So if you're the defense attorney, Dan, and you've been in that seat before, what are you trying to do ahead of tomorrow morning? What's your, what's your strategy session tonight? What are we going to see uh, just about, you know, 18 hours from now, not even? Number one, main point is the defense is going to point at how ridiculous the motive theory is that Alec Murdoch killed his wife and son because he might have been prosecuted for financial crimes. And that really is the prosecution's weakest point. And guess what? They were the ones who fought to bring it in. And if there is an acquittal, I suspect that might be a big part of it. But beyond that, the defense doesn't have a whole heck of a lot. They're going to go to the three or four points that were made that suggest just maybe there was another shooter. Take the engineer who suggested a shooter could be five feet tall. Uh, another expert who suggested that it's not impossible that there was more than one shooter. And then Murdoch himself taking the stand and saying, well, you know, there were all these people saying really nasty things about my son uh, on social media. And by the way, to which every journalist uh, has said, oh, yeah, me too. Everyone says nasty stuff about me on social media too. Notice none of those social media posts were introduced. It was just Murdoch's own anecdotal evidence. Danny Savalos, thank you much. I know we will talk again in about 24 hours from now uh, as this long-awaited end to the trial begins. Lots of other news happening today, including right here in Washington, where the nation's attorney general, listen, let's be real of how things got hot, right? Things got kind of hot in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. As Merrick Garland was talking about the work of the Department of Justice, dodging accusations that the DOJ is politicized, pointing specifically to how it handled protests after the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. Some senators upset about that. It got testy. It got testy in this moment. You're about to see between the attorney general and Texas senator and Republican Ted Cruz. Has the Department of Justice brought even a single case under this statute? It's a yes, no question. It's not a g give a speech on the other things you did. The job of the United States Marshals is to defend the lives. So the, of the answer is no. Is to defend the lives of the justices, and that's their number one priority. They have. Why are you unwilling to say no? Yeah, that's what it was like, right? That was the tone of things today. This is the first time that Merrick Garland, the AG, has been in front of this new Congress. And lawmakers had a lot of questions on all the things you see on screen here, right? Everything from school board meetings to fentanyl deaths. Ryan Nobles was all over it today. And this is significant, I think, nationally, because it's a moment where Senate Republicans were channeling the anger that they say they hear from their constituents over, for example, fallout from the Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade and those protests afterward. I think people remember, right, that um, protesters were showing up at the homes of some of these Supreme Court justices. That, that was a flashpoint about eight months ago. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. And, and what you saw was Republicans essentially lay out two prongs of this argument against Merrick Garland and then use that as a premise to say, in general, the Department of Justice uh, is unfair to conservatives. Uh, the first part of it being that they don't think that the Department of Justice, the FBI, the U.S. Marshals did enough to protect members of the Supreme Court after the Dobbs decision was released. And then the second part of it, which you heard Ted Cruz complain about in that uh, clip that you just showed, is that the Department of Justice, the FBI, did not aggressively look for the individuals who were threatening these members of the Supreme Court and then prosecute them and put them in jail. And what Republicans were saying during this is that this shows that the Department of Justice just isn't doing enough to help conservatives, uh, and that's part of their charge uh, in uh, helping all Americans. Yeah. Hallie. Tell us about some of these other testy moments, right? Because it wasn't just one single topic. School board meetings came up, accusations that the DOJ is politicized. Um, the, the attorney general was sort of defending the way that he's handled uh, investigations into former President Trump, President Biden, et cetera. Yeah, and in each one of these topics that you bring up, it, it really got partisan, and it was really all based 
in this premise that Republicans were trying to demonstrate is that the Department of Justice has become too politicized, and it's become too politicized against conservatives. And this is something that, that they've been making an argument for a long time. Merrick Garland hasn't been in front of this version of the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, since he's been Attorney General. This was their first opportunity to get all of these different topics in front of him. Hallie. Ryan Nobles, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So listen, do you remember Havana Syndrome, that mysterious thing where these diplomats and spies working in Cuba started saying some weird stuff, like that they were hearing bizarre sounds, they were feeling bizarre sensations, yet hearing, vision loss, memory, balance problems, they were nauseous, they were getting headaches. Well, today, we are now learning that one thing has been ruled out about what happened, at least according to a newly declassified review by U.S. intelligence agencies. They say this so-called Havana syndrome was probably not originating from a foreign adversary, from somebody like Russia. I mean, OK, but that's not much relief for folks like Tina Anifer, a former Foreign Services officer stationed in Havana who told NBC News about the moment this all hit her, saying, in her words, I felt like I was being struck with something, pain that I've never felt before in my life, as if I'd been seized by some invisible hand that I couldn't move. Here she is last year. It's very easy for people to be dismissive and say, but you look fine. But the reality is I'm not. And I don't think very many of us are. <laughs> and we just want to have our lives back. NBC's Ken Delanian is joining us now. So, Ken, this is not an altogether shocking conclusion from the mm -hmm. intel agencies. You and the national security team have been reporting, I think, for, yeah. for a while now, that it was unlikely that these intel agencies would find that, like, Russia or China or somebody else was trying to mess with our diplomats. That said, um, as we said, people like Tina want to know, what, what the heck happened? Where did this come yeah, from? Yeah, I'm so glad you played that clip from our colleague Andrea Mitchell's mm -hmm. uh, package because that shows there is real human misery behind this phenomenon. Uh, some 1,500 people, we learned today, I learned at a two-hour-long intelligence briefing, uh, have come forward and said they've suffered some version of these symptoms, some worse than others, but some can't work. And this was one of the biggest investigations in the, in the modern history of the intelligence community. They conducted for years intensive look at, at as many of these things as they could get their arms around, and they found not only no evidence of foreign involvement, they found evidence refuting foreign involvement. Remember, the working hypothesis for a while was this was an energy weapon, potentially right. microwave energy. Russia was the likely suspect. But they worked really hard to confirm that hypothesis, and they ended up refuting it. And they're saying there is no one set of symptoms here. So they're really saying there isn't a Havana syndrome per se. There are a lot of disparate and different situations. So this is just like one of these things that's like the Bermuda Triangle, destined to forever be kind of a mystery? Yeah, and I think what they, they didn't want to say this uh, fully, but there, there's a bit of a psychogenic factor here. When you ask a workforce, uh, if you feel any odd symptoms, please come forward and tell us because we think you might be under attack, you're gonna, gonna get a lot of reports. And by the way, reports they say have trickled that, uh, off recently because it's not in the news as much. So, but, but that doesn't explain, the, that core group of people, particularly at the US Embassy in Cuba, right. where some of them have documented brain injuries and they can't really explain it. They've said environmental factors, pre-existing medical conditions. They even talked about, in some cases, HVAC malfunctioning can cause pressure in a room, which can lead people to think but that doesn't cause a brain injury. They really don't have good answers, except they can tell us what they think did not happen. Ken Delanian, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. We've got some new developments tonight out of East Palestine, Ohio, where railroad union leaders say workers got sick at that train derailment where all those toxic chemicals ended up released. They're laying all of this out in some new letters that have just been sent to local and federal officials. They're saying people got nausea, they got migraines. They're sending these letters as part of a push for more train safety. It's happening as the Federal Railway Head is announcing some brand new inspections on trains in this country. Listen. FRA personnel are kicking off a nationwide focused inspections on routes that carry high hazard flammable trains and other trains carrying large volumes of hazardous materials. It's worth noting the timing here, because right now you've got the federal government facing a lot of questions and, frankly, criticism over the reaction and the fallout from this crash. Congress just announced two new bills to try to prevent disasters like this, real disasters from happening again. And there are plans to have the Norfolk Southern CEO testify in front of a Senate panel later on this month. All of it, as we're getting some brand new NBC reporting 
about new concerns and a long-standing controversy over where the toxic waste, the toxic dirt from that derailment is actually going. Gabe Gutierrez is live on the ground for us in East Palestine, Ohio. There's a lot of pieces to this, Gabe, right? There's a health component. There's a political component. You have new reporting about this very long controversy over an incinerator where this toxic dirt is going to go to burn up, basically. Hi there, Hallie. Yeah, a lot of layers here, and we are following up on that. Those concerns from some residents in a town just near East Palestine. This is East Liverpool, Ohio, which is about 20 miles south of where I'm standing. And some of those residents say they have had concerns about that incinerator um, run by Heritage Thermal Services dating back decades. It opened back in 1992. It was actually a major controversy during the presidential campaign back in 92. Al Gore was asked about it repeatedly. He made trips out here. And those residents say they have been battling against this plant where some of the toxic dirt from East Palestine is, ne East Palestine is now going to that incinerator. Take a listen to our conversation with some of those residents earlier today. How many of you are worried about this situation? They've just not been showing themselves to be good neighbors. The facility never should have been here in the first place. So Heritage Thermal Services, again, has run that, uh, uh, that incinerator now for decades back in 2015. The EPA says that between uh, 2010 and 2014, the incinerator had actually released uh, toxic chemicals into the air at high levels at least 195 times. Now, the company has always denied wrongdoing, and when it comes to this uh, toxic dirt that is heading there uh, from the derailment, it says that it is permitted to handle this. The local mayor in East Liverpool, we spoke with him, and he seems to take the company at their word, saying he has no major concern. But again, Hallie, as we just spoke with those residents, they do feel that they do have some concerns, and they are skeptical of federal regulators. You yeah. mentioned the head of Norfolk Southern. Again, he has now confirmed that he will testify be before a Senate panel next week. But the big question here, Gabe, like, and you know this, right, because you're doing the reporting on the ground with our team, timeline of when is this going to be okay for the people who actually live there? there? There are not answers that are satisfactory to folks who live in East Palestine. There's not even answers, period, whether they're satisfactory or not. Yeah, that's right. And look, it's East Palestine, it's East Liverpool, it's other communities in Ohio and other states have been, as you, you know, have been reporting, have been, uh, you know, they've been upset that some of this toxic material is heading to their states. And yes, they're every day, the residents here say they want more answers from federal regulators. We saw uh, just a short time ago, uh, now announcing more inspections. The question will be whether it will be enough and when residents here will get firm answers. It could be weeks, months, even years. Some have been waiting decades. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you very much for being there for us. We're going to look for more of your reporting on NBC Nightly News tonight at 6.30 Eastern with Lester Holt, wherever you watch your local NBC station. Big, big announcement in healthcare today because Eli Lilly, the drug maker, they are voluntarily capping the out-of-pocket cost of insulin at $35 a month. That is a big deal. That is effective right away. And it's a huge relief to millions of Americans who need that insulin to treat their diabetes. This is a price cap that applies automatically to folks who have private insurance. People who do not have insurance will be eligible through this copay assistance program that Eli Lilly has. The fact that insulin is so, so expensive has been a major political issue. President Biden and the American Diabetes Association are applauding the announcement today. We spoke with a woman who we met a while back who needs insulin, right? She needs it. She needs it to live. She told us cost has always been a concern, and she's worried that even this big step may not be enough. Lily could announce this today and tomorrow could make insulin 10 times as expensive as it was before. And nothing's stopping them. And, that, and that's what, what is so scary when you depend on insulin to live. Rahima Ellis is joining us now. Rahima, let's, let's talk about that, right? Because the Inflation Reduction Act would have forced Eli Lilly to cap insulin at $35 for Medicare recipients. They're making this decision themselves voluntarily to extend that price to everybody, all patients voluntarily here. 
Yeah, they are. But as you point out, there was this Inflation Reduction Act that imposed this $35 cap on this prescription drug for those who are under Medicare. We're talking about senior citizens. The Biden administration wanted that to be for all people, even those who had private insurance, but Republicans said no. What Eli Lilly has done is says we, they've been trying to drive this price down, and now they've made the decision to do it, and they're urging others to do it. But here's a big thing that's going on. It's not just politicians. It may also be public op opinion, but more than that, it might be competition, because some others are getting into this market and are saying that they are going to sell this drug at a lower price online. Mark Cuban is one of them. Hallie? Other manufacturers could do this too, right? Like, I mean, do, is there a sense among the people you're talking to, the experts that you're reporting with here, Rahima, that other manufacturers could end up lowering their prices for insulin too? Yeah, industry insiders are saying that Eli Lilly is seeing the writing on the wall. Competition is going to drive the price. Who would pay $200 or $100 for insulin if you can get it for $35? That may be the deciding factor. Hallie. Rahema Ellis, thank you very much. Good to see you. Appreciate it. Coming up, you know the spring is usually a pretty hot time to buy a house, but there's some new numbers showing that's probably not going to be the case this year. We'll explain what's going on coming up. Plus, the FDA making a big decision on the world's first RSV vaccines. That's in two minutes in the five things. Stay with us. We are just now hearing from Jalen Carter, the man who could go first overall in this year's NFL draft on the new charges he now faces connected to the death of his college teammate and a staffer at the University of Georgia a couple of months ago. In just the last couple of hours, Carter's tweeting out he plans to go back to Athens to answer for these two misdemeanor charges he now faces for reckless driving and for street racing. He says there's no doubt in his mind he's going to be fully exonerated. The charges add something to the narrative here of what happened on January 15th, when Devin Willock and Chandler LaCroix died not long after the Bulldogs celebrated their second straight national college championship. Police now say that Carter's Jeep and LaCroix's Ford shifted lanes a bunch of times, going way past other drivers that they were racing, essentially. A new toxicology report shows LaCroix's blood alcohol level was more than twice the state's legal limit. And data from the car shows she was going 104 miles an hour at the time of the crash. Shaquille Brewster joins us now from Atlanta. Okay, so, you know, we, we answer the question, th this has now reached the level of it is significant national news, right? Because you've got somebody who could be right. first in the draft, right, for the NFL, um, which there's obviously huge interest around. There's this horrific crash that happened that led to the deaths of two people. You had um, Jalen Carter canceling a press appearance today at the Combine here. What else do we know about all of this and the pieces here? Yeah, and let's just underscore what that means. He's canceling an appearance at the Combine. This is where you are getting scouted. You're getting recruited by NFL teams. Uh, so this has big implications for his, his career um, in the future. But what we know right now, we don't know his specific location, but in that statement that you read, it was clear that he intends to go back to Athens, presumably to turn himself in. And you ask about his role in that, ask, in that accident. Uh, police are saying essentially that he was racing the car that ultimately crashed and led to the death of those two victims, one being a fellow teammate, the other being a member of the recruiting staff. Uh, we don't know much more beyond that, but in according to police documents reviewed by local media here, a local newspaper, they say that police were able to determine through surveillance video that this was not a single car crash as was initially reported. Instead, they say their review was able and their investigation was able to determine that there were two Georgia players driving at the scene at that as that accident was taking place. So still a lot more to learn, but you definitely see uh, those uh, that warrant uh, being issued. And yeah. we know his intention at this point is to go back to Athens. We're not even two months out from this, you know, sort of horrific thing that happened to the Georgia community here, yeah. the deaths of these two people. The emotions are still so... Um, still so raw at this point. We heard from Nolan Smith, who's another Georgia player, who was emotional on this, emotionally remembering um, his, his late teammate. Watch. This is the first time I'm talking about it, and um, that's, my, that's my guy. You know, when that's one person that never did anything wrong, and I got sensitive in Cincinnati, I get sensitive talking about it just because I love him. We're also hearing from Carter's coach, too, yeah? Sorry, Hallie, say that one more time. I was I saying, I think we're, here, we're hearing it. from Carter's coach okay. as well. 
We are, Hallie. And, you know, you mentioned the emotions that you're seeing here. I mean, remember, this accident happened as they were celebrating their second national championship. Earlier in the day, there was a parade as they were going through town. So, of course, the community is devastated. And the coach saying today, I want to read this statement. They're saying the charges announced today are deeply concerning, especially as we are still struggling to cope with the devastating loss of two beloved members of our community. The coach goes on to say we will continue to cooperate fully with the authorities while supporting these families and assessing what we can learn from this horrible tragedy. You know, the initial statement that we got from UGA after this accident. They wanted to underscore, while of course still being sensitive to the crash, they wanted to underscore that none of the victims were engaged in any official team activities. And they did say that they were doing their own investigation to see if there were any policy changes that the school and that the athletic department can go through in the wake of this tragedy. Definitely an emotional uh, moment for that community, Hallie. Jack Brewster, thank you very much. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Iranian officials are looking into a string of potential poison attacks against female students. More than 100 of them were sent to the hospital. Hundreds more got sick after they ex were exposed to what parents say was like a poison gas or some kind of spray. Officials say they think this might be a deliberate attempt to keep girls there from getting an education. Number two, Elizabeth Holmes wants to delay her 11-year prison sentence because she just had a baby. Attorneys for the now disgraced Theranos CEO say she's not a flight risk because of her two young kids. They say she should stay at home while she appeals her fraud conviction. Her sentence is supposed to start at the end of next month. Number three, an FDA advisory panel now recommends approval of two RSV vaccines for adults. Now, this is significant. It would be the first vaccine available for a virus that kills thousands of people every year. RSV was one of those big three threats this winter in the triple-demic. Remember, it was RSV. It was COVID and flu. Now, this is for adults, so obviously it would be helpful for the elderly who are particularly vulnerable. Still nothing for kids yet, though. We know that infants are especially susceptible to RSV. Number four, Nissan, recalling more than 700,000 rogues because of an issue that could lead the engine to shut off while you're driving. The car maker says there's some kind of a defect in the key fob. That's the problem. Rogue owners are being told, don't like attach anything to your keychain while Nissan works on a permanent fix. Number five, Prince Harry and his wife, Meghan Markle, have been asked to leave their residence at Frogmore Cottage in the UK, according to a spokesperson for the couple. That process started not too long after Harry published that explosive memoir of his, Spare. It's not like they're going to be homeless, of course. The couple spends most of their time at their home in Los Angeles. No comment from Buckingham Palace so far. So listen, here we are. It is the first day of March. Spring is coming up quick, and that is typically the time people think about maybe buying a new house, or if they're gonna, they start thinking about it now, right? It's a hot season for home buying. Not this year, though. The number of people applying for a new mortgage has dropped to the lowest it's been in nearly three decades. 6% down last week compared to the week before. And looking at the numbers from a year ago, look at that, down 44%. Why? What's driving these numbers down? Well, mortgage rates are up. Right? Like, that's common sense. Last week, we saw 30-year fixed mortgages rise to 6.7%. That's up half a percent in the last month. It's now the highest rate since November of last year. Let's bring in CNBC real estate correspondent Diana Olick. You know, it's interesting. This is usually a busy home buying season. It's like Zillow time, right? And now that there's fewer and fewer people applying for mortgages, help us understand it. Well, it's like you said, Hallie, it's this, right? Mortgage rates are going up again. Yeah. And it's weird because they kind of gave us a head fake at the beginning of the year. We saw rates go way up in the fall, over 7%. That stalled the fall housing market. But then they came back in December and January. All of a sudden, a slew of buyers go into the market. Pending home sales, which are signed contracts, people out shopping in January, jumped 8%. Then boom, what happens? Rates start shooting back up again. And what do we see in the mortgage applications from home buyers? Down for an entire month because people simply can't afford it on these types of monthly payments. They could afford it last year with high home prices because rates were so much lower. And as I always say, people don't buy the home price, which are sky high. They buy the monthly payment. And the monthly payment is considerably higher on the same house now than it was a year ago. And they simply say, I can't pay that. I'm sitting on the sidelines. I'm going to wait. What happens to make mortgage rates go down? Like, in other words, what needs to happen for those numbers to drop? Well, that's a very big question. You have to ask the Fed, right? So, look, the thought was that inflation was coming back and that the Fed was not going to be so aggressive on raising interest rates. Now, mortgage rates don't exactly follow the Fed, but they do kind of follow what the Fed's thinking about the future, if that makes any sense. So... 
we thought that inflation was pulling back. Now the Fed's saying, mm, maybe not so much. Maybe we still need to be more aggressive. And that's what's been causing mortgage rates to go up more in the last three to four weeks. So until we start to see inflation really pulling back, more signs of it, more reports saying that, it, we're not going to see rates come down that much. The bigger question is when do home prices start pulling back more? And they are down about, you know, 4% in the last six months, but that's not a lot given how high they are. They're still up year over year. So we need that affordability back in the market. We need more homes on the market. And unfortunately, we just found out in a report today that the number of new listings in February is down dramatically from last year. So we're not getting new supply, which yeah. means prices, they're going to remain sticky high. Dan Ola, good to see you. Thank you very much. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, this new study shows more and more young people are being diagnosed with colon cancer. We're getting into the why of it all coming up. There's this new study out today showing colorectal cancer, which is the second deadliest form of the disease in the U.S. It's a real threat, not just to older Americans, but for people who are actually quite a bit younger. Found 20% of new cases happen in folks younger than 55. That number has nearly doubled in the last 30 years. So, like, if you're in your 30s, early 40s, you should be listening to this. Because the American Cancer Society finds that diagnoses keep ticking up steadily for that age group. It's up 2% every year for people under the age of 50. The disease, which doctors expect to see more than 150,000 new cases of this year, is still mostly in adults ages 65 to 74. And luckily, there's a bit of good news here. Doctors have made a ton of progress on treating and preventing colorectal cancer over the years. Overall, there was a 46% decline in diagnoses and a 57% decline in deaths over the last couple decades. That's because of healthier habits. People are, like, smoking less. They're eating less unhealthy stuff. There's been a successful campaign to get people in for colonoscopies. NBC's Dr. John Torres is joining us now. So lots of progress to, like, fight back against this. I'm old enough to remember, you know, Katie Couric and her incredible advocacy after she lost her then-husband. Um, and yet we are seeing this fairly significant uptick in younger people getting it. Why? And Hallie, this is almost a tale of two decades and a tale of two different populations. If you look at the statistics here, from 2000 to about 2010, the incidence rate was actually dropping 3 to 4 percent. But then starting this last decade, it's actually only started dropping about 1 percent. But depending on the population, that is usually for people 65 and older. For those under the age of 50, like you mentioned, it's actually been going up 2 percent per year. And so that is an alarming statistic, seeing those going up there. And we think there might be a couple reasons going on here. One, when things like this happen, and we started looking at environmental issues, modifiable factors that the patient themselves have that they can work on to keep their colon cancer risk under, under control as low as possible. But on top of that, also, we dropped the age for colon cancer screening to 45. That message has not gotten to everyone. And like all cancers, the earlier it's detected, the easier it is to treat, the more successful that treatment is. And so that needs to be emphasized as well, Hallie. Um, there's this other study that was published uh, by scientists with the British Medical Association that projected that rates of colorectal cancer will more than double, like not even in the next 10 years, between now and 2030. Doctors say get screened, get that colonoscopy. What else can we do? What else should we be doing? And Hallie, there's factors that you can't really do anything about. Those are the genetic factors, the family history of colorectal cancer. You might have ethnic, ethnic or racial factors as well could be coming into play. But the modifiable factors are the ones you can work on. And those are the ones that we know can put you at increased risk. Obesity, being overweight, being inactive, not exercising, not getting off the couch. If you have a low fruit vegetable diet and a high saturated fat diet, that's going to put you at higher risk, as will smoking or moderate to heavy alcohol use. And so modifying those can go a long ways towards getting that risk factor under control. And like I mentioned earlier, getting that colorectal cancer screening, if your average risk at 45, right. if you have a higher risk because of family history or something like that, then you need to think about doing it even earlier. Can we real talk here? It's not like colonoscopies sound awesomely fun for a lot of people, right? There's this new product of Cologuard. <laughs> Everybody's seen the commercials for it. SNL spoofed it over the weekend, the idea of this Cologuard screening here. If people are a little bit nervous about going under for a colonoscopy or they're worried that insurance won't cover it if they're too young, whatever, is Cologuard a replacement for that? Is it as effective as a colonoscopy? I suspect the answer is no, but how can it be helpful? And Hallie, the actual word here is it depends on you. If you're average risk and you don't want to get a colonoscopy for whatever reason or can't get it, then Cologuard is a great test to get. But realize you have to get that every three years versus a colonoscopy, which is every 10 years. 
But if you're higher than average risk, then colonoscopy is the way you want to go. And so it's a great tool to use for some people, but not for everyone. And so talking to your doctor about what you need to use, your own risk factors, your own family history, that's the way you need to look at it in order to make sure you're getting the test that's best for you. Dr. John Torres, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, one Florida Republican is trying to ban the Democratic Party from the state. Just wants to get rid of it. The new bill that's being called the Ultimate Cancel Act. That's what it's called. Next. Plus, McDonald's getting a little bit of heat for a new meal deal with a couple of huge stars. We'll tell you what's going on with them, with Cardi B, and the whole rest of them uh, coming up in just a sec. So tonight, let's talk about this Florida, Florida State Senator's push for what's being called the Ultimate Cancel Act that would basically get rid of the Democratic Party in the state of Florida. Here's the deal. And if you're like, wait a second, Hallie, how's this going to happen? So let me walk you through it. The bill would require that the state's elections board, basically the division of elections, would immediately cancel filings of any political party whose platform has ever advocated or supported slavery. slavery. The proposal does not explicitly mention Democrats, but... If you think back to your like eighth grade social studies class, right, pull out that old book. During the mid 1800s, the Democratic Party at that time did support slavery. If this bill passes, it means that something like 4.8 million in people, Florida, would go from being registered Democrats to having no party affiliation come July 1st. It's a response to what some Republicans have called cancel culture from the left. And really the latest bill that fans the flames of what a lot of people see as these culture wars between Democrats and Republicans, and specifically in a hotbed of all of this, which is Florida. Ali Vitale has done a lot of reporting in Florida, Ali, um, and you, you know that state well. Uh, it, is this something that is being introduced to get headlines, right, as the ultimate cancel act and to get people thinking? Does it actually have support? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty big troll, and the lawmaker in Florida who's sponsoring this effectively copped to that on Twitter when he was faced with the idea that this was just a very big political trolling act. But at the same time, this is also something that speaks to the larger ethos in Republican Florida politics right now. It's partly why you're seeing Governor Ron DeSantis use this as sort of his incubator before he takes the whole show national. Because look what this one Florida lawmaker is saying, sort of by way of explanation for this. And you can either see it as serious or tongue in cheek. I think either of those are critical. But he says, for years now, leftist activists have been trying to cancel people and companies for things they've said or done in the past. This includes the removal of statues and memorials and the renaming of buildings. Using this standard, it would be hypocritical not to cancel the Democrat Party itself for the same reason. Again, a lot of language in there that seems pretty tongue-in-cheek, pretty trolly, but Republicans have a supermajority here. You remember, the whole state went red. It wasn't just Ron DeSantis who won by 19 points, which in a state like Florida is pretty wild for a margin. It's also happening throughout the state at the legislature level. So this could be something that passes. I mean, I'm, I'm going to watch and see. They've got the numbers. It's just whether or not they actually want to go through with the full troll. But, right. They have the numbers. Do they have the appetite for, like, fulfilling the troll, as you say? And it's not like yeah. I mean, Florida's Democrats are like, yeah, this is a publicity stunt, they think. But it speaks yeah. to this broader, whichever side of it you're on, this broader thing in Florida, which is the idea that it is a... Um, like an incubator for some of these culture war issues that we see pop up in other places around the country. Yeah, it's sort of like an epicenter for anti-wokeness, and that's the point. For DeSantis, the way he's endeared himself to the conservative grassroots is by taking on these culture wars and largely legislating around them in schools, on COVID, on a whole number of different fronts. That's the point for him, especially as he takes this national, as he considers a presidential bid. The reason why advisors say he's so focused on the Florida legislative session, why he might delay a presidential bid announcement till the summer, is because this is the tangible outgrowth of the culture wars. DeSantis has been able to take them from theoretical talking points on Fox News actually into tangible policies, and he's doing that in part because he's got the numbers to do it in the state legislature. Ali Vitale, thank you very much. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our East Coast Bureau, rapper Travis Scott 
Wound up with New York City police after an alleged fight at a nightclub early this morning. A sound engineer told police Scott punched him in the face and damaged 12 grand worth of equipment before leaving. A spokesperson for Scott is calling the whole thing a misunderstanding that was resolved in just a couple of minutes and maybe a cash grab, they say. The NYPD says they're not looking to arrest Scott over this. From our West Coast Bureau, North Cascades National Park in Washington State has the highest death rate in the country. NBC News looked at 15 years of federal data and found the park recorded 3.7 deaths for every 100,000 visitors. That's more than three times the rate of the next deadliest parks. Some say the park's ban on bolted anchors, which is used by rock climbers, could be to blame. From our Midwest Bureau, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot now becomes the first mayor in that city in 40 years to lose re-election. She made history when she was elected, the first black female, the first openly gay mayor of Chicago, but her reputation took some hits as the city struggled with higher crime rates. She also lost the support of some big labor unions. Now you've got a mayoral race between former Chicago schools head Paul Vala, Vias and the county commissioner Brandon Johnson. All right, a business story you may not expect now about Cardi B and Offset. The, I don't have to tell you, the super famous rapper couple and their new meal deal thing with McDonald's. If you eat there, if you see the ads, you know what I'm talking about, right? The two of them promoting McDonald's. It was part of like a V-Day promotion over Valentine's Day. McConnell's leadership loves these celebrity meals. They say they're a big driver of sales, okay? So who doesn't love it? Some of the franchise owners. The Wall Street Journal reports that some owners say, nope, we are not going to promote this Cardi B and Offset meal because these owners say they don't want to be associated with that couple. Complaining that, like, their songs, their lifestyles don't line up with the McDonald's brand and eats away, they say, at the company's, quote-unquote, family-friendly image. McDonald's leadership is kind of clapping back, telling NBC News in a statement, we're focused on putting McDonald's at the center of culture. Caleb Silver is joining us now. What is interesting here is like the question of is McDonald's having a brand identity crisis? Because the big sort of leadership doesn't seem like they are. They're like totally down with Cardi B and Offset. They want to do this. Some franchisees aren't so hot on it, apparently. Yeah, 2,100 calories of controversy here just with these Happy Meals. They're really called Famous Orders, and this is the date night dinner between Cardi B and Offset, and it's wildly popular on social, popular in a lot of cities and a lot of McDonald's franchises around the country, but the Journal reporting that some are, are saying that they don't want to have anything to do with it because it goes against McDonald's family-friendly vibe and also it violates the Golden Arches Code. Believe it or not, McDonald's has a code for its franchisees, and that code specifies a a lot of the things that franchisees cannot do, including partnerships with celebrities or influencers that have potential risk to damage the company's business. So this is a very tricky spot for McDonald's because this is so wildly popular, but there is allegedly some pushback among some of the franchisees. There, this is not the first time that McDonald's has done like a celebrity sponsored meal. Travis Scott, BTS, they've all had their own. And it's not the first time that franchise owners have said they don't like it. Is there a bottom line? Like what's so interesting about this to me is, it, is like as a business story, right? Like McDonald's is trying to position itself at the intersection of like culture and brand management. They're getting pushback. Could they lose money? Could they make money off this? Like where's the bottom line impact? Yeah, controversy is only going to be good because now people right. want to see what's We're in. We're talking about it, right? People yeah. want to see what's in the date night dinner. By the way, that's a cheeseburger with barbecue sauce, a quarter pounder with cheese, <laughs> large fries, and this large orange drink, the high sea orange lava burst, large Coke and an apple pie for $13.00. 50 cents. So it's already getting a lot of buzz on social. Cardi B's uh, Instagram and Twitter posts get millions and millions of hits and likes. I think McDonald's loves the publicity. And we don't know how many franchisees, uh, franchisees are complaining about this. Are we talking about, you know, 10 percent of franchisees? Are we talking about only five or 10 of them? So there is controversy, but controversy is probably good news for McDonald's in this case. And they love the attention. Michael Jordan was the first celebrity endorser uh, McDonald's used all the way back in 1992. They brought it back with Travis Scott back in 20. 2020, and it's been working, and now this latest one seems to be getting a lot of attention and a lot of interest. Caleb Silver, uh, thank you. I, I assume you've, you've tried the Cardi B and Offset meal, so congratulations to you. Enjoy your apple pie. Thank you. Still to come here on the show, Chris Reddy, Chris Rock, I should say, is finally getting ready to talk about that Oscar slap. Remember that? Almost a year ago. But that's not the only reason we're telling you about it. This is also a huge moment for a huge streaming service. It's coming up. Netflix planning to make history with an event that made history. Saturday, 10 p.m. live, Chris Rock is going to talk about the slap. You know the slap. I know you know the slap. It was literally seen around the world when Will Smith went on stage at the Oscars, 
slapped Rock after Rock made a joke about Will Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith. It's also a historic moment for Netflix. They're doing a live event for the first time ever, right? So this is the first time ever that Netflix is streaming something live for its 230 million subscribers. A top executive there telling the Wall Street Journal it's a real change in the construct we have with our members. Bravo's Darren Karp joins us now. So fascinating on multiple fronts, Darren. Yep. Let's start out with what this means for Chris Rock, right? Like, he's never done, like, some big dramatic tell-all interview. He didn't, like, sit down with Oprah to go right. through the slap thing. But he's going with the format that seems to make him comfortable, and that's stand-up here. I, I think it's actually a genius move. You're right. He never went on any of, you know, he didn't do the morning shows. He didn't right. do a, a special about this. He's doing it in the best way that he knows how. He's a comedian, so he's going to make a joke about it, you know, and he's uh, he's uh, pretty much kept silent about it. You know, he's gone on tour. He's kind of implemented a few jokes here and there to see how they're going to see how they're going to land. But this special, again, to 230 million subscribers is a way to hit back. And for lack of a better term here, it's going to be a really big punch. There's also um, the business component to this because there's a real sort of moment for Netflix here. Yeah. In the last few months, you've got that CEO um, walking away. They're embracing ads. They're doing the whole everybody knows the password sharing <laughs> crackdown. You know, now this live event, maybe, you know, the first, but maybe more to come. All of it is meant to, like, draw people into Netflix. What does this mean for them moving forward here? I mean, they are becoming a powerhouse. Again, they're, they're actually on the upswing of a number of subscribers. As much as we hate that password sharing uh, debacle going on here, but 230 million subscribers, they're doing a pre-show. They're doing an after show. They're up for Best Picture for an Oscar this year. I mean, Netflix is becoming sort of this catch-all place for us to view everything. And so now doing live events, they are really putting back appointment viewing into their platform and sort of creating this other part of Netflix we never really had before. You know, it really had the market on binging, but now they're really capturing Right. live events it's going to be actually pretty incredible to see netflix pull this off what's so interesting is they're like creeping into the territory yeah. that is kind of the last big stand for the traditional networks right like we know listen i know this because i work in the industry but like live is what drives people to watch sunday night football or exactly like, an award show. like it's not the you know the stuff that people can get on demand here and now Netflix clearly sees that and is like we want a piece of that we want our pie and that pie too I think they needed to get creative a little bit you know mm. I mean we have big properties we have a lot of IP Netflix you know just has their programming and so how are they going to capture that sports market how are they going to get appointment viewing back this is the way to do it and Chris Rock sort of being the person to start all that off is genius in my opinion and it's going to be a really great special so I know you'll be watching if I uh, could ever stay up late enough past 9 45 <laughs> I would watch we'll see Darren Carp, thank you. Appreciate you. Uh, appreciate all of you for watching today. Man, it's been a busy hour, busy day, all of it. We'll uh, see you tomorrow. I will see you same time, same place. We've also got more coverage right here on NBC News Now. That picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.